Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for being with us here in the how to, which we call the hard stage of talents or the talent stage, which is the center for uh, many discussions, also the interactive ones. And as you can see, uh, this collaboration with the How Hebel am Ufer uh, kind of feels very natural because we are in the How Hebel am Ufer. This is actually a collaboration which is ongoing over the course of the days. Nevertheless, I'd like to introduce and seize this moment to introduce you also personally to the artistic director of the How Hebel am Ufer and uh, Annemie. Probably you can briefly let us know why we particularly chose this session which is going to come. Welcome again. Probably we've met from far on Saturday in the How One. Um, when we were speaking about secrets, and um, you said, well, you just had this series Spy on Me, um, which was like, we didn't call it a festival, but it was kind of a festival with performances from theater companies dealing with big data, and we also had a very interesting um, discussion. And I think that was where the connection was, that we also always see the theater as a space for public discourse. Um, on this stage, there's not only people dancing and performing, but always people thinking aloud and talking about what is moving them. And um, I think there is a connection with this afternoon. I'm, I'm very much looking forward also to, to be in the audience myself. So I think it felt very natural to, to collaborate on this one, Florian. Yeah. Thank you very much. And also the key word you've just made, so using different media formats for different ways of creating impact, this is already something which we're going to talk about here. And let me briefly introduce you, but warmly introduce you to the moderator first. It's Hans van Trotha, and he is going to introduce you to Eric Schlosser. Enjoy the session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Yes, welcome to this uh, discussion. I'm, I'm very happy, very excited um, uh, to introduce to you Eric Schlosser, um, who probably uh, all of you know, but I still introduce him. Um, he was at the Berlinale last year with a film we are going to discuss a little bit later, The Bomb, um, what it is. But what is really very special about his work, he is an investigative journalist, so he has a lot of stories to tell but he chooses media. He is uh, sort of the perfect example for a cross-media career. He wrote books, here are some, some of them. He made documentaries, <clears throat> he made uh, conceptual documentaries, movies. Um, he also wrote two plays and the children's book. Um, his absolute uh, bestseller is Fast Food Nation, which is a book and a film. We will talk about that later. Um, some other books are Reefer Madness, Command and Control, Gods of Metal, the plays Americans and We the People, and the children's book that gave this discussion the title Chew on This. He was executive producer of Fast Food Nation and the movie There Will Be Blood. He was co-producer and protagonist of Food Inc. and executive producer of Food Chains and Hannah Ranch, and the film which has his, his handwriting in the most strong way, probably is The Bomb, where he was author, producer, and director. Um, in Food Inc., <clears throat> there is a sequence where you explain how you became an investigative journalist. I didn't want to show that in the film because as we have you here, could you explain us just in a few words how this happened? Could you? Sure. I can't remember the sequence from the film. And um, I became an investigative journalist because I had not had success as a playwright. And then I was working for an independent film company in New York, and I was commissioned to write my first screenplay. And I, I finished my first screenplay, and what began as a very edgy independent film was taken over and turned into a terrible Hollywood screenplay. And so I wanted to do some form of writing that I could control the words. And um, so I tried nonfiction. And particularly in the United States, there has been in the last 25 years a real resurgence of nonfiction. And, and in many ways, it's the great era of nonfiction writing. In the same way, it's a great era for documentary filmmakers in which the hierarchy between fiction 
and nonfiction is is disappearing. So I've tried to I try to do a kind of nonfiction. It sounds pretentious to call it literary nonfiction, but to do to do nonfiction in which every word matters and you tell a story in a way that is interesting. And as a writer, I chose to write about things that the mainstream media is ignoring or distorting or things that are being deliberately hidden from view. That's in, that's in all your books and all your films. It is <clears throat> topics that way. And it's not that easy to drag people's attention to them because they are dangerous, they are ugly, they are um, um, disturbing, uh, uh, disturbing. And um, it is, it is, um, there's a difference between the European market and the American market in publishing. Hmm. Um, we, especially in Germany, but also in other European countries, we tend to produce books that combine text and images. And the American market is much more separating. And all these books have not a single image. So you tell, sometimes you tell the same story, once just with words, without showing anything. And then, we, as we will see in Fast Food Nation, um, in Food Inc., and especially in The Bomb, you tell, this, uh, tell the same story without a single word, just yeah. showing images. Can you tell something about this how you choose which topic to, at which time for which audience um, is in which medium? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things I feel very fortunate in having done different kind of work in different medium, and I really, I, I mentioned hierarchy before, I really don't believe that these hierarchies that have been created are real. And I feel like uh, a great screenplay is really as important as a piece of writing as a, as a great novel. And screenplays are very, very difficult to write because they're so compressed and there's so few pages, relatively speaking, that if you have 10 bad pages of a screenplay, they really stand out in a way that 10 bad pages of a 400-page novel the reader might be willing to overlook. So I, I really don't believe that one form is higher than another and it just seems what fits and for the last 20 25 years i've primarily been a writer of prose and so the books don't have pictures because i'm really struggling to convey in words as best as i can and create the images with words so we were talking earlier the book that i'm working on right now is on the american prison system and I've been going into prisons in the United States since the early 1990s. And this may be the first book that I will include images. I have a friend who's a photographer who's been going into prisons. And it really is the first time as a writer that I have strongly felt the inadequacy of my words. I mean, as a writer, every day you feel inadequate. And it never, it never, turns out on the page as brilliantly as it is in your head. But in this case, the things that I'm seeing in American prisons are so unbelievable that I feel like um, I'm going to have to include more photos and maybe a photo essay or two or three photo essays in the book that will go along with the words. Is it also going to become a film or a documentary or when even I'm, a movie? When I'm when I am writing a book, all I am concerned with is writing the book. And I think it's very, very dangerous if you're a writer, if you're thinking about the film or you're thinking about the other opportunities while you're writing the book. And I won't mention the name of the writer, but there's a writer in the United States whose work I hugely admire. And then I heard he was writing this book and simultaneously working on a documentary that was going to be timed to come out with the book. And I wondered how that would work. And the book, the book isn't good. It's so hard to write something that people will want to read that for me, quite honestly, all I'm focused on is trying to write something that people will start on the upper left-hand corner of the first page and get to the last page. And then once I'm done with it, and once it's out in the world, that's when, if there's somebody who's interested in an, 
another medium, then I meet with them. I mean, up until the bomb, the reason that there were documentaries or there were films based on my work, it's because I was approached by directors. Okay. And my experience, because I started out in film before I started out as a writer of prose, I really believe, even though it's a collaborative medium, it's really a director's medium. So when I make these decisions about whether it's a film or not, it's really based on the director. And what I say to myself is, do I want to see this director's interpretation of my work? Because once it's a film, it's not mine anymore. And, and my role is really to try to help the director achieve his or her vision. And, and I'm, I'm so fascinated and curious once I get to know these people, to see what they will create based on, it doesn't have to be a literal interpretation of my work, but based on the same world that I've explored through words, how are they going to explore that world through sound and image? So, <clears throat> two questions before we go to the concrete uh, work. The first, I, did I get it right for you? The book is the first thing, to tell the story in words. The book is the first thing, and you know, Even though I started out as a playwright, um, academically, I studied history and I got a graduate degree in history. So I had written long form prose. And I had a professor as an undergraduate who was one of the great American literary figures of the last 30, 40, 50 years, but he writes nonfiction. His name is John McPhee. And he's not as famous as he should be, but he is the most extraordinary, inspiring writer. And so as an undergraduate studying with him, he just emphasized writing as a craft. And in the same way that making a table is a craft if you're a carpenter. And he created an ethic in his students that you care about every word. Mm -hmm. You care about every punctuation mark. There has to be a reason that you make these decisions. So with my own work, I spend an enormous amount of time trying to figure out the structure. And I, 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 I really care about the words. I care about it as a reading experience. And so that's what I'm focused on when I'm writing a book. So without flattering, <clears throat> I have two quotations, I, and, and I absolutely agree. Um, the one was the New Yorker who said in Command and Control, this is how nonfiction should be written. And really, it is true that you can learn a lot how you can tell a story without images in, uh, in this story. And the other one I really liked is Eric Schlosser. It's Los Angeles Times um, about fast food nation, that Eric Schlosser may be the, the Upton Sinclair for this age of mad cow disease. He has a flair for dazzling scene setting and um, a resonant of startling facts. So, um, it's I so nice that you haven't read out some of my bad reviews <laughs> because there have been people who've said exactly the opposite. So thank you but, very much. No, but uh, I, I really, we have a very different tradition of uh, nonfiction writing in, in, in Germany. Yeah. So, so this kind of really exciting, this page turning um, uh, um, uh, nonfiction writing is not that common here yet. Um, but I think, especially in these books, it, is, it, it, re it really works. So the second question I, um, I had is, do you really, are you in the position to decide if you make a book, if you make a film, if you make a movie? Are you completely free with it? So that is, um, do I understand it right, that you can, you're free in your decisions? Uh, I have managed uh, to write what I want to write about, what I want to write about. And if any of you see that three years from now, um, there is a Lady Gaga biography that I've written, you know I have some problems with my mortgage. And, uh, <laughs> but for now, I mean, it's really, it's a fight. It's just a constant fight to do what you want to do and write what you want to write. And I had a lot of lack of success in the early part of my career, and I just made this decision that if I could, I had to do what I wanted to do, and even if nobody read it, and even if it wasn't successful, I would have the experience 
of doing it. One of the interesting things about the nonfiction, because again, I started out as a playwright for years, and then I was in film, is that my nonfiction work has gotten me out of my office. And in retrospect, I'm grateful for the years of failure because the nonfiction work has taken me into parts of the United States I would never have seen. It's introduced me to people I would never have met. It's so broadened my awareness of the world and almost in an existential sense, for me, the experience of writing the book is as valuable as the book itself. So I, I can't control whether the book will sell, I can't control if the critics will like it, but I feel very grateful for having met these people, learned these things, and just had these life experiences, even though a lot, I mean, I write about very dark and unpleasant subjects, but when I, I've always wanted to be a writer since I was 10 or 11 years old, and the writers that I always admired when I was young were the American writers in particular who threw themselves into the big issues of their day, who were very much engaged with society and engaged with trying to change things. So, you know, Upton Sinclair, John Steinbeck, Arthur Miller, John Dos Passos, those were the kinds of writers that really set a kind of example. I'm sure. And I'm mentioning them not because I belong in that category, but those were kinds of the things, the people that inspired me to do the sort of thing that I do. And they were cross-media artists. I'm sure Upton Sinclair would have made documentaries if it would have been... Upton that Sinclair time. financed Eisenstein's yes. last film. Yeah. Um, so the topics you choose are the ones that go really, really deep into the actual problems of society. Yeah. And one of the reasons why I chose um, to start with the, your last film, The Bomb, is that it became so extremely actual after, um, after it came out. Yeah. Just, um, it is, um, there were two books going ahead. Uh, Gods of Metal in 2015, and before that, the big one, Command and Control. Yeah. And then in 2016, it became this film, which was presented at last year's um, Berlinale, where I saw it yeah. for the first time. Um, it is not a normal documentary. Could you uh, give us a brief introduction what kind of film that is, The Bomb? So I'm not even sure it is a, a documentary. Mm. Um, it's good, a, good it's a, there, was a, there was a documentary, so I wrote a book about nuclear weapons that came out in 2013 called Command and Control. And Command and Control was about how has the United States managed its nuclear arsenal since the first detonation of a nuclear weapon uh, in 1945. And I told the story of the management of the American arsenal through this nuclear weapons accident that occurred in Damascus, Arkansas in 1980 in which uh, a missile having our most powerful nuclear warhead almost, uh, the warhead could have detonated, and if it had detonated, it would have destroyed the state of Arkansas and much of the eastern seaboard of the United States. So I used a narrative of this one nuclear weapons accident to go back and forth in history and look at all these other incidents and the real challenge of managing nuclear weapons. And the person who directed a documentary called Food Inc., which was partly inspired by Fast Food Nation. His name is Robert Kenner. He made a documentary based on my book, Command and Control, which was a, a more traditional documentary. And it was released uh, theatrically in the United States, and then it was on television. So uh, I, with a friend of mine, wanted to make a film that was about the same subject, but in a, in a non-linear, almost visceral, intuitive way. So the film, The Bomb, uses archival footage like a documentary does, but there's no narration, there's no plot. Uh, it combines original animation with archival footage, and we had an original score written by uh, an electronica band, The Acid, and when we did um, The Bomb at the Tribeca Film Festival and at the Berlinale, the band played the soundtrack live as the film was shown. Now, having said that there's no plot, 
and there's no, there's no narration. It's very carefully structured. I, and hopefully you don't, you're not aware of the structure as it's unfolding, but it's not just a series of random images. Um, the film is in, uh, on Netflix, so you can all uh, see it, and um, you can even download the, um, the soundtrack, I think. Yeah. Uh, on an extra, there, there's an extra um, uh, the website the for the bomb. Um, I, I had a look, um, and uh, we are going to see some brief um, clips right now. I spotted nine chapters in, um, in the film. Hmm. Um, I don't know, they're not marked, but um, I just want to give a brief idea of these nine chapters because I have a question about two of them. It starts with order, with, with a symmetry, cleanness, so with parades which are very far from the bomb itself. And that is, that starts my question. I realized at this point, a little bit later in the film, and also in Food Inc., um, that um, both sides, the evil side as well as the investigative side, work with, um, uh, uh, with a certain aesthetics with symmetry. Mm. You, symmetry is, uh, means order, means cleanness, means safety, means beauty. So you have these symmetrical um, um, uh, fields, you have these parades, and I also have a little clips about symmetry in the propaganda of the 50s um, in the nuclear, uh, in nuclear politics. So I would like to talk about that with you. Then the second chapter is the beauty of the bomb itself. Um, all our archive material. Then the pipe crackers. We have the beautiful German word, Rohrkrepierer. So these mm -hmm. bombs that don't um, do what they do. Mm -hmm. For the explosion. Five, the exploding objects, which mm -hmm. is something else. Mm -hmm. Um, then animals, then <clears throat> um, commercials and propaganda, we'll see some of that. Then what it does to men, which is, of course, the most difficult and most impressive part of the book, and the ninth chapter would be politics. Hmm. That is how I saw it. That's interesting. Um, <laughs> but one thing I want to make clear is that the work that I do is very much engaged with social issues and very much I'm trying to be a writer engaged with what's happening in my society. I've really focused on the United States, but I'm really trying not to write agitprop. I'm really trying to write things that are complex, that are open to different interpretations, because that's, I think that's intellectually honest, and that's what's interesting mm -hmm. to read, and I hope that three different people can read something I've written and come away with three different ideas, but what I'm trying to do is um, make people confront things they don't want to confront, make people think, and if it's really successful, make people feel or have compassion. So in this film, The Bomb, you could make a very anti-nuclear, simplistic kind of condemnation of nuclear weapons, but what's interesting is um, these explosions are beautiful. They really are, if you like fireworks. <laughs> and, and the machinery is incredibly beautiful. Yes. And just, you know, there is, there is a similarity in many ways between my book on nuclear weapons and my book on industrial agriculture, which is Fast Food Nation, because in both of them, they are mankind's, uh, you know, desire to control nature, to create order, to, to, to have control, and the, the subtitle uh, of command and control, one of the phrases in the subtitle is the illusion of control. And I think when you see how these systems break down in the production of food with all kinds of unanticipated consequences, it's very si similar to this notion that we can control nuclear weapons or even nuclear power safely. Let's have a look um, um, at, the, at the first clip, some passages from the bomb, from, from three what I would call chapters, different chapters. So, my, the co-creator of the bomb, Sridi Keshri and I, wanted to take this subject, which is probably the greatest issue of our day, but is not being discussed, and deal with it in a, in a way that goes beyond logic, that goes beyond, you know, and especially having written the book and then done a conventional documentary, I wanted to create something that worked on the most 
visceral, intuitive level uh, because, you know, these weapons are the culmination of the rational scientific method taken to their ultimate that can destroy the world. So what I didn't mention is that when we did the bomb at Tribeca, we did it in a huge space with eight enormous screens that fully surround the audience. And the band played in the middle of the space, and there were about 800 people surrounding the band. And the film was made to be seen multi-screen surrounding you. And we did it at the Glastonbury Music Festival this past summer with eight screens. But it's sort of difficult to do that. There's a venue in London called the Roundhouse that we're trying to raise money to do it there with eight screens. So if, if any of you watch it, uh, on Netflix, on your phone. Um, I'm really honored and flattered that you would do that, but it's sort of, it was meant to be seen so that you're completely immersed in the film and the music is working on a whole other level and I'm just, I'm just trying to find different ways to get through to people uh, about but, what's happening. But, but do it, I, I, I looked at, uh, I watched it three times <clears throat> with uh, um, uh, with earphones and loud music, and it worked. It, n not on the phone, but uh, on on the screen, it does work. So uh, mm. give it give it a uh, give it a chance. And it is a it is a very irrational experience because these um, images are so seductive, mm. and they are twice. And that is what I wanted to talk about with you. There there are there were when they were produced. But some, by somebody else, and then yeah. they are used by you as a seduction as well. And the reason why I chose these three, the last one is simply the question, how much was this end of the film inspired by the end of one of uh, the major masterpieces of film history by Dr. Strange, Strangelove, or uh, How I Learned to uh, Love yeah. the Bomb? Yeah. Was that the inspiration, or was it just, did it just come out to look very similar? Um, it's interesting that you would ask that. Dr. Strangelove is one of my favorite films. It really is a great film, and I've written about Dr. Str after, oh, after my book, Command and Control, came out, I wrote a piece for The New Yorker about Dr. Strangelove, and it's a, it's a multimedia piece that they put online because for those of you who've seen that film, it's sort of a farce about nuclear weapons and the end of the world, and it's brilliantly done. But what's scary about Dr. Strangelove is it's probably the most accurate depiction of the management of our nuclear weapons in that period. Mm -hmm. It's more accurate than anything that you could read in newspapers or magazines at the time because Stanley Kubrick was so obsessive for all of his films. And he just did years of research on nuclear weapons and he read everything he could and he interviewed everyone he could. So even though it's a farce, the actual details that he captures are right on the mark. So the ending of the bomb is a comment in some ways on the ending of Dr. Strangelove, but uh, I'm trying to reverse, <laughs> reverse the ending of Dr. Yes. Strangelove. Oh. <laughs> I would prefer that we not all die. <laughs> That's, um, uh... And you, you can see that here. The reason why I chose the other two is um, what I mentioned before. So you, you seduce us um, to deal with this fear, with this horrible problem, with this, um, with this madness, how many billions are spent for this crap. Um, and you do it with, um, with, with the same aesthetics that they do. You use this, um, and then there is this, um, um, uh, this um, propaganda um, um, TV clip that you're supposed to be tidy and have your symmetrical order, then nothing will happen, happen even if yeah. the bomb comes. Yeah. Um, so how do you, yeah, what is um, uh, your way of dealing with this kind of um, um, seductive aesthetics? I guess is to acknowledge the seductive part of it and then look past it to the lies that are the foundation of it. I mean, so, you know, the, the theme being secrets, so much of my work has been an effort 
to help people see how they're being lied to and to look at very, very powerful bureaucratic forces, both governmental and corporate, and how they try to um, you know, guide our thinking and what the reality is behind the lies that are being given to us every day by advertising, by government officials, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I'm, I'm just sitting as I'm thinking here, it's not a deliberate thing, but, you know, Fast Food Nation was really about, it was about food, but it was really about um, unchecked corporate power and greed and what the consequences are. And, you know, my prison book in many ways is about unchecked state power and what the state will do to people who threaten the interests of the state. And I don't mean in a political sense necessarily, like political dissidents, but in the United States, you know, it's basically a war on the poor. That's how you can explain much of our prison system. So, I don't know, I guess that's what I'm, that's what I'm thinking about, whether I know it or not. So, um, we have another sequence uh, from the bomb because of course the most, um, a uh, challenging moment is to show what really happens when the bomb fell. And we had this experience, as, um, as we all know. So, um, as you saw, this film is very loud. The music is very loud, it's very seductive, it's very um, images as well as, um, uh, as the audio track are very, all, uh, very aggressive. Um, so, that is really interesting after these books without any images. And uh, then, can we have the second um, clip of the bomb? That is the after the bomb exploded. <laughs> so this is when you see see the movie and concentrate, and it really uh, a shock because it is so loud, it's, it's so colorful, it, is so, it also is funny in a way. Um, and then the explosion um, leads to a black screen, complete blackout. And then there's no voice, no music, no and, and an approach to what we all fear you will show and you show in the end, uh, which is the people being harmed, which follows to that. So, it's possible that some people who go see this live may actually be having a really good time. Um, it's almost like you're going to see a band that has an incredible, you know, background film. But then, um, again, the way the film is structured, this section comes what I hoped would be the right moment to kind of end the fun. Uh, these weapons are beautiful. The explosions in many ways are beautiful. Uh, countries want these weapons because they're seen as symbols of power. You know, the film opens with these parades in which not just nuclear weapons, but all these weapons are kind of fetishized as symbols of power. And when you see the missiles, they really are symbols of virility. I mean, it's not very subtle at all. And then, um, and the propaganda is ironic and, and amusing. And then, you know, if the film works, you get a sense, okay, well, here's what they do. And here's what they do to people. And this section goes on a little longer. We were very conscious. If you look at the footage of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings, there are just horrendous images of what's happened to civilians. And as bad, if not worse, as what happened to the civilians is how the wounded were treated by the medical authorities. They were almost treated like they were laboratory experiments. And there are, the, there are these newsreel footage of American doctors kind of examining the skin falling off of victims and measuring it, you know, because they were more concerned to learn what the impact of the atomic bomb was than to actually save this person. And we didn't use any of that footage. Uh, the only footage of people that we used was people who somehow seemed to be cooperating and looking at the camera and speaking to the camera without words about, okay, look what you did to me. 
Um, so the, the few people who are in there, we felt were people whose stories we were trying to tell, not people who were being treated like laboratory animals. And it was a very difficult decision because so much of the film is kind of exciting and thrilling and draws you into the evil allure of these weapons that, you know, it's a very fine line when you get to the carnage of being exploitative of, of other people's suffering. And so that section begins with paintings made by survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And again, we're trying to represent their voice of this experience rather than use their misery and suffering as something that's amusing or, or entertaining. And the film, the film continues for a while after this section, but it's a very deliberate attempt to just completely shift the tone of the film and completely maybe shift the audience's awareness of what they're seeing. I would very much like to come to the other big topic uh, of your work, Fast Food Nation, as well. But as we were so deep into the bomb now, I would like to open the discussion for the public if there are questions or remarks on, on this work, um, its backgrounds, and of course, uh, uh, to Eric Schlosser um, in general. But maybe uh, there are questions or remarks. Yeah. There is a. Oh. Maybe there's there's a wonderful microphone to be thrown if you catch it. If you. Yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if you think, in the midst of these modernization programs, if people still think of. Uh, the destructive power of nuclear weapons in the context of 1945 or back when they filmed nuclear tests? Yeah, so every country that has nuclear weapons right now is modernizing their arsenal. And once again, nuclear weapons are being seen as symbols of national power. And it's remarkable how profound the historical amnesia is and how little people know about nuclear weapons or remember how they were used and their consequences. And one of the aims of my work has been to serve as a reminder that these things are not symbols, they're machines. And they're machines that work. Um, and when they work, they have terrible consequences. And when they go wrong, they can have terrible consequences. So, you know, there really is a need. When I, was, when I was at university in the 1980s, everybody knew about nuclear weapons and everybody talked about them all the time, much more than people talk about climate change today because there was a real awareness that there could be a nuclear war any day and we all might die. I mean, there really was an apocalyptic feeling in the 1980s when Ronald Reagan was president. And what's concerning to me is there's almost no awareness of it. There's almost no meaningful discussion of why do we have these things? What are they for? What do they really do? Where are they aimed? And yet, you know, the danger is probably as great right now as it was 30 years ago. There are some people who think the risk is even greater now than it has been since the end of the Second World War, that a city will be destroyed by them. And it, there is a question back there and one in, in the front. Could you, could you pass the microphone there and then, oops. Um, I'm very happy that, uh, that you mentioned uh, briefly the film Koen Niskatsi uh, because it's, um, it's also one of my favorite films and by accident yesterday I had a long discussion about this film. Mm. Uh, but how do you see the bomb in, in relation with, with this film? With, uh, with Koen Niskatsi? Yeah. So, um, I loved that Koyana Squatsi dealt with th these issues in a non-linear, non-literal way and combined images and music in a way that for, when did it come out? Did it come out in the 1980s? 
Yeah, 82, I think. Yeah, in a way that was just so bold. And um, so we tried to be bold in the same way. We tried to create something, again, that's not just random images, that takes you on a whole journey that's carefully structured, but is just, it's just one more way of getting at the truth. And when it's staged, you know, with a film completely surrounding you, it's a very, and with good, with, when the film completely surrounds you and the band is playing live and there's good speakers, it's a really powerful, visceral life experience. And I get back to my good fortune at having written plays and written books and been involved with documentaries and feature films. There's no one way to get at the truth. And that's why it's been so incredibly rewarding for me to work with other artists who take something I've written and are inspired by it and try to give their version of that same subject. And so for all of you who are making films, you know, I think it's very liberating that you can not only play around with, well, how am I gonna tell this story, but um, is it gonna be fictional? Is it gonna be documentary? Do I want to use a conventional narrative? Do I want to, you know, have a, a, a radically different kind of structure? And they're all equally valid as long as they're sincere and they work. <laughs> there was another question down here. Oh, and, and the, yeah. Uh, the music, I would like to ask about the music that uh, you choose to use in these clips that we have seen, in particular the music you chose for uh, the parade, military parade scenes. And then um, I personally associated it with some kind of, I don't know, disco techno uh, music, mm. and um, uh, which is kind of fun in my perception, uh, dancing music. And um, I would like to ask you if this is what's uh, and intentionally uh, done, or, uh, or maybe like how, how did you uh, make this choice? Or maybe you considered several options for, um, uh, for um, the music for this uh, scene. Thank you. Yeah, well, we really um, felt that the music had to be electronic because so much of the film in my book is about machines and technology and the imperfection of technology and so it just seemed right that it be electronic music. When we were editing the film, um, we were using a lot of minimalist techno that seemed to work very well with it. But we always wanted it, we were just using that for editing purposes, but we knew that we wanted a band that would perform live and we listened to a lot of bands and through, friend of, through a friend of my collaborator, Smriti Keshari, there is a band called The Acid and the two principal, the three principal people, one of them is Adam Freeland, who was a very successful house DJ in England in the, you know, in the last decade or so. And the vocalist, who also is, uh, is, um, is uh, helping to write the music, is Rye X, who has his own form of kind of like electronica folk, folk electronica almost. And then there's the third member is Steve Nalepa, who in Los Angeles has been part of the electronic music scene for the last 15, 20 years. And they, they are very skilled at a variety of forms. So the music is very different in different parts of the film, depending on that sequence. I mean, the, the military marches are beautiful absurd, uh, deeply disturbing in the way that these weapons are fetishized, redolent of power, a certain kind of organized, almost militarist fascist power. And it's unbelievable to me, having watched so many of those marches in order to help put together this sequence, that the current president of the United States wants us to do the same thing. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. But it also makes total sense. There was a, in here in the front, pretty far throwing, please. <laughs> in the third row, there's, uh, whoops, perfect. Nice. <laughs> um, uh, a very high um, 
US military officer, former one, just said to um, German Spiegel Online, one of our ma main media, um, that he thinks that no country leader would uh, enjoy to press uh, the red button, that um, nuclear weapons are just used to um, guarantee the sovereignty of a country. My question is um, if you believe that. And second, um, maybe can you uh, tell a bit about your investigative work, like uh, if you have people to help uh, do, do this and how you make the reduction, like what out of all this goes into a movie? That's my and, two and questions. The, the, what was the last part? Um, yeah, um, the first part is if you yeah, I got agree the first, to this officer. I got the first and the second. And oh. the second is like about how the process, how you do yeah. your work with yeah. the team or not, or alone. So and how you do you? the reduction yeah. of all this material. How do you decide what, yeah. what can go into this visual media? So where do you find and how do you choose the material that is used? For a, for a book or for a film? No, for, 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 the a film. For, for the film. For the film. Okay. So, Harry Truman was the president of the United States in 1945. I genuinely believe he was a good man. I think he was a very good president. And he made the decision to use two atomic bombs. Actually, some people think he only made the decision to use the Hiroshima bomb. And it's possible he didn't even know that the bomb was going to be dropped on Nagasaki. That's kind of scary in and of itself. But I completely believe that a world leader would order the use of nuclear weapons. Um, their militaries create these weapons, train for the use of them, create all kinds of protocols for using them. And if they didn't plan to use them, they wouldn't have them. So yes, I think it's quite possible that a world leader will order the use of nuclear weapon. And what concerns me as much is I think it's quite possible that an accident can occur uh, or a low-level officer who's not supposed to use a nuclear weapon could use a nuclear weapon and start a nuclear war and, and much of, much of my Strangelove. that's what happens in dr strangelove but much of my book is about how close we've come again and again to losing american cities and losing cities in europe to nuclear weapons accidents um, for this film the bomb while I, was, uh, while I was writing Command and Control, people were giving me all this footage of nuclear weapons. And it was really, f and not just on nuclear weapons explosions, but on the design, on the workers creating them. And it was really useful for me to see these films as I was writing the book because it helped me visualize things. And um, it just gave me such a better sense of that world. So I had all these nuclear weapons films and I, when, when the documentary was made based on my book by the director, Robert Kenner, I just gave him all this footage and he used some of that in the documentary. And then um, when Smriti Keshari, myself and Kevin Ford, who's the other director of the bomb, um, set out to create it, we had all that footage that I'd collected, plus there's just an enormous amount of footage that the United States government has released most of it. Some of the most striking footage was actually shot by the Chinese. They haven't released much. And there's just a little bit of Russian footage. So poor Kevin Ford, who also was the editor of The Bomb, and he, he's probably watched more nuclear weapons footage than anybody who is alive on this earth. And I just don't know what I've done to his life as a result. But once we had the film structure and once we knew in a thematic way what we needed in different parts of the film it was really about what are the most striking images and how do they fit with one another as you go from image to image so it's really you know it's it's no different from any editor you know with a director who's shot an enormous amount of film how do you winnow it down, we felt like about, we, we aimed for about a 45 minute film and we wound up with a film whose running time without the credits is closer to 55, but there was just so much stuff to put in there. The, the only difference for what we were doing is that, and you didn't, was there, I don't think there was any animation 
in the in the sequences you showed. Was no, there? there wasn't. So, but there are animations so the animation was supervised by this incredible British artist named Stanley Donwood, and Stanley Donwood has been the artistic director of the band Radiohead since its inception, pretty much. So he's responsible for all their album covers and for the look of their artwork. And he and his brother created the animation that comes and goes throughout the film. That's the only thing that we could really create from scratch. And other than that, we, you know, we, we didn't shoot any footage. We were bound by what we could find, but there's just such extraordinary images that we found that you know, there was no shortage of things to use. There is another question. Hi. <clears throat> so first, uh, a few thoughts. I wrote some stuff down. Um, when I saw <clears throat> your film, it had for me very, or the, these sequences, it had some sort of sexual uh, undertone to it. The, these pretty women with big weapons, these guys, handsome, muscular. You can't, a uh, human brain, brain can't uh, see more than six or seven at a time, and you see these masses, you see thousands of people. And um, we're also fascinated not only with sexual undertone, but also with the inferno of the whole thing. And my question is uh, to you, do you think what is so fascinating, because when I watch this, I think like, this is very destructive, but at the same time, it's very impressive and somehow cool because the bombs are so incredibly beautiful. So my question is, like, for example, the Nazis took uh, crystal meth or ISIS fighters took synthetic party drugs. Do you think what fascinates us about uh, atomic bombs or, and, and big weapons is the divine and supernatural and uncalculable element to it? Well, you know, if you want to talk about sexualization, you should watch the sequences in the film that involve missiles. Uh, because, you know, they really do look a lot like penises. <laughs> and, and the beginning of Dr. Strangelove is an incredible montage sequence of American bombers being refueled. And the refueling involves this long nozzle that's inserted into the front of the plane. I mean, it's just, people are weird. I mean, they're, 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 it's about power. It's about you know, not just virility and sexuality, male sexuality being expressed in these weapons, but it's also power over nature. And, you know, it goes back to like the, the you know, Icarus and the desire to fly and, and, and in terms of the supernatural, it's almost, I almost get more Freudian. There's like, a, it's like the death wish it's, it's a manifestation of the death wish. It's this impulse towards annihilation um, that's very, can be very attractive. I mean, if you, if you have a, if you're living in a way that's profoundly self-destructive, it can also be kind of fun on the way down. You know, some of that really self-destructive behavior is enjoyable in the moment. It's not enjoyable when you go off the cliff and that's it. But, uh, but I think, you know, when you look at these weapons and you look at the way that they're fetishized and you look at these symbols of power and certainly just seeing those vivid, high definition, beautifully choreographed marching sequences that these countries produce, you know, it absolutely reminds me of, of Lenny Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will and a lot of the Nazi propaganda. Uh, it's those, those, choreographed sequences and the way that they're shot are straight out of, you know, Triumph of the Will. So there are these human impulses that transcend generations that we have to fight against. Um, I'm wondering why uh, did you find the fascination of making this um, this book and this film? Why did you make it? And also, why did you think that you would be the guy that would tell the story? That's actually a good question. I mean, you know, 
I, if I'm passionate about a subject and I really care about it and I feel like it's important and that people need to hear, then I do it. Um, it's more than 10 years ago that I started getting really worried about nuclear weapons. And I was really worried that this was a threat that wasn't being discussed, that um, people needed to have a dialogue about it once again. And I heard this incredible story of this nuclear weapons accident in Arkansas. And even if there wasn't a nuclear weapons threat today, the story in and of itself, I thought was an amazing story. So I just decided to set off on this path. And again, when I started writing my book, I thought it would be a very thin book about nuclear weapons. And it wound up becoming, you know, a thicker book about nuclear weapons because I learned more and more and became more amazing. And, and the book is about nuclear weapons, but it's also about technology and complex technological systems and how they work and how they don't work. And it applies to all kinds of technological systems, not just nuclear weapons. So when I was doing that, um, I wasn't thinking, as I said earlier, I wasn't thinking about the film. I was just trying to write an interesting and compelling book about a subject I thought that was really important. And um, we could come up with a whole long list of subjects for which I'm probably not the right person to write the book, <laughs> quite honestly. But I try. I try to be the right person <laughs> for the things I write about, and I can, only, I can only follow my own interest and my own passion for a subject. Maybe we have one, one more question, yes. and then we go, <clears throat> we pass over to the another subject, which is very much your subject, um, maybe for the last 20 minutes, uh, fast, fast for nature. So I think it's so great that you have all these different forms. Like you say, there's so many different ways that you can get at the truth. And it's amazing that you would have this very sort of creative nonfiction narrative simultaneously with a non-narrative, very experimental film. I wonder if you could talk at all about how you make decisions about what form you might want to use and what distribution or exhibition platform. So how, what goes into your thinking for that? So, if I'm interested in something, I try to think, well, what is it? What, how would it be best? And the reality is we can take any one subject and we can give it to a playwright, a documentary filmmaker, a feature filmmaker, uh, a novelist, a, f a painter, and each one of them could do something absolutely amazing on exactly that same subject. And for me, I've really been focusing for the last, the main, my main mental exertion has been on writing books. So that's where my main work has been. Uh, but after this prison book, I, I don't know. I, I will have written some very long, dark books about problems in America and, and maybe I'll make a documentary about, um, you know, kayaking or, or maybe something you make, like that. Or may, maybe you make the documentary you're missing in this program about stand-up comedians yeah, and stand-up comedians. <laughs> but, but again, back to the film. But So once my book is done, it's immensely gratifying for me to work with other artists, with directors whose work I admire. And for these other films, for the most part, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm a producer, but I'm trying to help the director make the film that he or she wants to make. So in some of the documentaries, I'm in the documentary, and it's not because it's in my contract that if you make a documentary based on my book, I have to be in the documentary uh, for a certain amount of time. What usually hap what's happened is that the documentary filmmaker has run up against a problem and something needs to be explained. And so, okay, Eric, you want to come in and provide that kind of transitional moment, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I'm just, you know, very, I mean, the, the feature film uh, based, on, um, based on my book, Fast Food Nation, that was directed by Richard Linklater, uh, I helped him with the screenplay, but I was involved with that for a very simple reason. I wanted to see Richard Linklater's 
vision of the same world that I'd written as a book, because he was, he, he, he was and is, I, you know, one of the directors I most admire. And so to see what he would do with this material is, uh, is amazing. And, and that was the same, you know, it was a more complicated, much more complicated thing, but There Will Be Blood came out of, you know, my same desire with Paul Thomas Anderson, who I think is one of the great American directors. And I, I had this material that that film is based on, and, uh, which is an Upton Sinclair novel called Oil. And, uh, and I was looking for a director who would make that into a film because I just felt like it was such a relevant and powerful work. And when Paul Thomas Anderson appeared and he was passionate about it, it was, you know, I just want to see what he does with that material. So, so for these films I've been involved with, except for the bomb, I'm really trying to help directors do what they want to do, but also see what they do with my work or something that I'm involved in. So, yeah, th this question brings us to the other big topic, uh, which is the food industry <clears throat> in the United States. Yeah. And there we have a documentary, we have a movie, we have a book. And could we have the clip uh, number four, Fast Food Nation, how this movie tries to seduce us to deal with this really, really ugly, horrible, nasty topic? So you actually drag us in there, uh, or, or link later, like into a documentary with the first uh, sequence, or isn't it? You know, I wouldn't say it's a documentary, but it's an attempt to show the reality of the United States. And, and I, really, I really like the film, and the film got some very good reviews. It was completely dumped by its distributor, and I think, in some ways, you know, you can never choose the time at which your film comes out. That film was made over a decade ago. The film is essentially a modern reworking of Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. You know, my book, Fast Food Nation, had many different parts of it, but the heart of the film, Fast Food Nation, is the story of the abuse of undocumented immigrants in the meatpacking industry. And without giving away too much, um, you know, one of the central plot elements is about the sexual exploitation of poor immigrant women. And maybe that was a, something that people didn't want to deal with a decade ago, but, you know, with the emphasis now on um, what's happening in Hollywood uh, and what's happened on college campuses in the United States in power relationships with women, I think it's amazing that that sort of publicity is occurring with all these actresses stepping forward, but particularly in the United States, there's almost no emphasis on the women who are the most powerless in society, who are undocumented uh, immigrant women in meatpacking, who are farm workers, who are factory workers, and you know they are being exploited the same way that actresses and and uh, and and other television personalities are, but they have almost no voice, no access to the media. And that's really the story that we try to tell. Um, and yet, uh, as I said, the, the distributor dumped the film and it didn't find an audience and it didn't resonate, but I think it was really brave. It's a really brave thing of Rick to do more than a decade ago was to focus on you know, some of the most despised people in the United States, and particularly about how, um, how immigrant women are mistreated. So th that, that was the second filming approach to Fast Food Nation. The first one was extremely uh, <clears throat> successful yeah. and influential, which was Food, Inc. Yeah. Uh, probably one of the most influential uh, documentaries on the food, uh, food theme. And Yesterday, we saw Fernando Solana's uh, journey through the fumigated towns yeah. um, um, together. And then in the discussion later on, he said, and I think that fits quite well to what we have been discussing so far, he said these films about, um, uh, about these uh, food and exploitation of nature and what, uh, what is going on don't tell anything new. They take what was written in the books before and they contribute and I think that was interesting, what they contribute is the perspective of the camera. 
How do you, what, what, how would you, what do, you, do you say about that comment? I think they do contribute something new. Okay. Um, I think, you know, again, I'm very, I'm very grateful that my books have been useful to inspire these films, but with each one of these films, there's been not just, not just something new, i.e. a person who wasn't in the book or a story that wasn't in the book, but they're very much the, um, the expression of the filmmaker. And because Robert Kenner uh, is a different person from me, you know, his film has something new because it has his sensibility. And I do everything I can to help the director out, but what I want to see is his film, because if I wanted it to be my film, then I'd direct it myself, and I don't want to do that. So I, I, I greatly respect the director of that film yesterday, uh, but I, I disagree with him on that point. I think, you know, and in some ways you could say there's nothing new under the sun, and that these stories have always, always been, you know, it's the same story being told again and again, but these stories need to be told again and again because they need to be told each generation. It's like passing on stories so that each generation doesn't lose this knowledge, whether it's about food or it's about war or it's about, you know, it's remarkable as I'm doing my prison book that so many of the arguments that are being made about prisons right now were, were made in 1883. So it's, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing to, to repeat. You already said that you want to integrate photographs, which would be new for you. What would have to happen that, you, uh, that it also turns into a documentary? Or even into um, a movie? I have to finish the book. And so I have to finish the book so that the book exists for itself, by itself, as a book, written as a book. And then, you know, there has to be a filmmaker okay. who I like and is the right one. I mean, for, for Fast Food Nation, Fast Food Nation was out for uh, quite a while and I was approached by many different filmmakers and I was approached by a number of well-known documentary filmmakers and there just had to be the right feeling between myself and the filmmaker and also I just had to trust that what they would do would be something that would honor the subject. Okay. Not honor me, but honor the subject the right way. Any more questions, maybe? There is a question. Far through. <laughs> You're good. Park. Oh, there. <laughs> um, so, hi. I'm very curious. Uh, as a documentary filmmaker, having a lot of good intentions, um, telling the truth, or whatever that may be. Your truth. Yes. Um, with the, the resistance I can imagine you would get with uh, tackling such big subjects, which are unconventional or uncomfortable, as it says in the text, your, your work is known for revealing uncomfortable truths. So, what is your role working with this resistance? I mean, what sort, of resi what sort of resistance do I encounter? Yes. Yeah. It's interesting because when I was doing the nuclear weapons book, I was very worried about how these government agencies would respond because nuclear weapons are the greatest national security threat the United States or any country faces, and the secrecy around nuclear weapons is the greatest secrecy because these weapons are so destructive. And I had information that was maybe border, borderline classified information. I'd done so many interviews with nuclear weapons designers that maybe they had told me things I didn't know. So I was very paranoid and I made multiple copies of my hard drives and I hid them at different locations and I gave them to different friends and I was so worried about what the government would do. And then the book came out and there was absolutely no pushback whatsoever. And it really, it really amused me because here I wrote a book about the most dangerous national security threat and there was no pushback. But when I wrote a book about hamburgers and french fries, it was unbelievable, the pushback. 
because these corporations, these food corporations, are some of the meanest, most ruthless, most unethical corporations on the planet. The only ones that come close, well, maybe some of the banks, but also uh, the private prison companies. So with Fast Food Nation, I had to be so careful about being sued. My legal fees were enormous before the book was even published because I had to get my own libel attorney to go through the book, et cetera. After the book was published, when I was on book tour, the food companies sent people, like I'd be in an audience like this, and people would come and disrupt my talks. Uh, people would come up behind me with banners. They were all being hired by the food companies. When we did, uh, when we did um, uh, Food Inc., me and the filmmaker were told that one of the food companies had hired private investigators, that they may have infiltrated our social circle, and you know, it's just, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. McDonald's, there was, a, there was a group in London called London Greenpeace, and they were handing out pamphlets in front of McDonald's restaurants in London, criticizing McDonald's. And I mean, it was just, you know, basic form of protest. McDonald's hired corporate spies to spy on London Greenpeace, and so at some of the meetings of London Greenpeace, there were more McDonald's corporate spies posing as Greenpeace activists than there were real Greenpeace activists. And it later came out after Fast Food Nation was published, not only was McDonald's spying on London Greenpeace, but so was Scotland Yard. And Scotland Yard had its own undercover agents going to London Greenpeace meetings. So you might have had a London Greenpeace meeting in which there were like two actual activists <laughs> and 15 people from either the government or McDonald's pretending to be activists. And it pisses me off so much that if you are going to be a critic of corporations that you have to feel any of this threat. And it's just, it's just, it's amazing to me that I never wound up being threatened writing about nuclear weapons, but that hamburgers and french fries can, you know, destroy your life and your career if you say the wrong thing or do the wrong and thing. And if you watch Food Inc., it's part of the film because one protagonist after the other um, uh, stops talking in, in, the film, in the middle of the film because the companies um, uh, threaten them. Yeah. So this is one way to integrate it into the film. Yeah. Uh, a quick, <laughs> quick. Well, oh yeah. I'll give it after, to you quickly after. Um, you said that some people believe that the threat of an, um, a nuclear war or nuclear, the use of nuclear weapons is more imminent than after World War II, and that most people don't seem aware because of incredible historic amnesia. Um, what do you think personally? Is it, is it actually more imminent than after World War II? So, I've gotten to know all these weapons designers and all these major figures in the United States who played a major role in our nuclear weapons policy. One of them was Secretary of Defense during Clinton's administration. His name is William Perry. He's an engineer. He is the most grounded, stable, rational, calm, lovely human being. And he's been involved in nuclear weapons issues since the early 1960s during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Excuse me. He was one of the people with a magnifying glass looking at the photographs every day from Cuba to find where the Russian missiles were. Uh, so he's been at the heart of these nuclear, nuclear weapons issues really since the early 1960s. He believes that the risk of a nuclear catastrophe is greater now than it has been since the end of the Second World War. And his reasoning is, it's not just the United States and the Soviet Union involved in this arm race. It's the United States, it's Russia, it's North Korea, it's India, Pakistan. Um, these are all very volatile uh, countries and, and relationships at the moment. Personally, I'm not apocalyptic. Uh, I'm 10 years into the subject of nuclear weapons. I don't lie in bed at night 
worried that the world is about to be destroyed, but I'm really concerned. I'm really concerned. And the rational response to the threat that we face right now would be a million people in the street next weekend demonstrating against these governments, you have no right to threaten our existence and threaten this planet. And you had those demonstrations. I mean, during the 1980s, probably one of the largest demonstrations in American history occurred in Central Park in 1982 against nuclear weapons. There were about a million people in Central Park. There were similar demonstrations in Hyde Park in London throughout Western Europe, and those massive demonstrations played a major role in ending the Cold War peacefully and in putting pressure on Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan took office you know, as a lover of nuclear weapons, building up our arsenal in the United States, and he left office genuinely believing that we should abolish all nuclear weapons. He was sincere about that. So there needs to be public awareness and there needs to be civic engagement with this issue. And if there isn't, the odds of something terrible happening is just much greater. It's sort of, you know, my feeling is that people are sort of sleepwalking as this train is approaching them and about to run them over. So get together later today uh, at the place where there's the best sound system and have a look at the film. Then you have an example for a very contemporary film way of dealing with that topic. Eric, thank you so much for your thank time, you. for, uh, for being here. And uh, we wish you a great time here in Berlin. And we are looking forward to more books and to more films. Thank you. And I have just one last thing to say. So I write about really dark subjects, but I feel like to be alive, it's really good not to live in denial and to confront these things. And so rather than feeling depressed and overwhelmed by them, my advice is enjoy the day. Not only the first journey, the first publisher of Canada, the Philippines.